I won't wait too, too long. I don't imagine there'll be too many people showing up, but it's all good. It's all good because people will eventually see the video and they'll watch it or they won't. And that's all cool. But for when you still watch it, hey guys, how's everybody doing? This is Peter Branscombe. I'm living in occupied Canada. Probably talking to lay low too. Sorry. Peter Branscombe in occupied Canada. So. Let me play something here. Something that our education minister said, I don't know when it was, it's pretty recently. Nobody voted for him, I don't believe. He just was appointed. Somewhere I will find you. There we go. So. That's Don McCarty, and he's saying, you know, we, we've got to keep the unvaccinated out of our schools, out of our public office, out of our blah blah, blah out of society. I mean, if they don't, if if they don't want to uh, partake in what everybody else is doing, frankly, then that who doesn't want to die, um, get really sick, then you know they'll just have to be cut out of society, <laughs> right? And he just says it just, just, I mean, what else can we do, people? What else can we do? I know what we can do to you, Dom. But your day's coming. Your day's coming. And, it'll, and it won't be from my hand or anybody like that. It'll be from somebody that just gets turned loose. And it'll be a bad thing. I mean, nobody likes this man. There's nobody liked him before all of this. And now because of all of this now and how he's just his, you know, little Napoleon complex has just grown to that, that thing. Napoleon, at least he was a general that uh, could fight and knew what he was doing. This guy is just a little weasel. Really, because what he is, he's a nerd boy who got made fun of his whole life. But he never quite got that whooping that he should have got. You know, the one that really sets him straight. He never got that. He had made fun of. So it was enough to, you know, build a inner rage, a deep-seated rage, so that one day, you know, he could fulfill his revenge of the nerds type delusional fantasy. Right? He just didn't quite get smacked hard enough. Maybe not quite enough wedgies, swirlies, stuffed in enough lockers. I mean, he's I, he doesn't look like a very large man, so I, he looks like you'd be able to, you know, you'd be able to compress him down in one of those lockers, no problem. Probably was his home. It was probably it was probably his home room when they did roll call. They just walked by his locker. Dom here here. All right, Dom, you stay in there. I bet you the teachers even didn't like him. No, I shouldn't be like that. 
but I feel like that. <laughs> He's, uh, I, I really think that's an evil man, the way he carries on. And he's just so, he believes it when he says it, right? That's the thing. That's what's scary about an individual like that. He's not scary, but he feels that he's got all the power and authority behind him. That he's going to tell you what can be done with your children. And what can go into the bodies of your children, right? He's the education minister. And he says that. Well, they're not your children. They're the province's children. Yo, armchair, what's up, bud? What is up? Just talking about our favorite Dominic Cardi, education minister in New Brunswick. He's a real, he's a real cheeky fellow. Uh, so I was going to talk about Adam Green tonight, but I really... I, I was thinking about it hard today and I, I'm i going to go and do my thing with him, but I'm not going to spend as much time as maybe I could because it really, he's really not that important. What's more important is that he's leading a lot of people astray. I'd say a lot of young people. I'd say a lot of Adam Green's fan base probably the younger younger kids younger generation i mean he has this great big long beard and long hair and he thinks he's this viking right and then thinks he's viking jesus right he's got his little no more news picture where he's you know oh, viking warrior right I don't know if the dude's ever been in a fight in his life. You know, seems pretty frail. I know he played basketball. I've seen those videos, so he's pretty athletic. But I don't know. I don't think he's a Viking warrior. I don't think. And then he's got his little little trinity symbol, right? The spiral trinity. You know, it's funny because he spends so much time mocking Christ and God and the Holy Spirit, but yet he's got his own little Trinity symbol. That's that's funny. It's really funny. It's funny that he tries to replicate his appearance as if he's Jesus, right? As if what he looks like is what Jesus looked like. Long haired guy with friggin' long shaggy beard. You don't know if that's what Jesus looked like. He thinks that Cheshire, Cheshire Borgia, right? Cheshire Borgia Jesus, Fidel Sassoon Jesus, he thinks that is what Jesus looked like. And so he tries to replicate that, that, or he thinks that his fanboys, fan base, no disrespect to people that follow Adam, but his fan base, I've seen them message, make message to him talking about, oh, you look like Jesus. And he's like, oh, no. And um, I don't know. I think something like that, you should immediately rebuke that. Because first of all, you don't know what Jesus looked like. And second of all, he just looked like Adam. Adam Green. And I'm not going to go too far into, like, you know, who Adam actually is and everything like that. I'm going to get into basically the biblical aspects of it because if you want to look on somebody that's done a little bit of a deep dive on Adam Green I'd go to Enigma Report uh, he hasn't uh, done many videos on Adam for a while but <clears throat> there was a while ago he made some pretty pretty good videos going in depth talking about Adam and you know Adam's past and what he might be linked with and so on and so forth and it's uh that's more that side of things, which is very much entirely possible, which goes along with the, what's his name there? Dave Goldberg, that video, the guy that came out and said that this Adam Green guy was literally gonna be used as a controlled opposition to bring a bunch of people into this idea and this thought process where basically 
they would end up being on a federal watch list, right? Because what's he doing? Right? What's he doing? He's stirring up a particular group of people, right? That's what his whole thing is now. He, he started out being his all, you know, meek and mild and humble Adam. And then with a shaky voice, he started going into Zionism, right? And then since going against Zionism and Kabbalism and whatnot, he since has moved off Kabbalism and his main target lately has been Christianity, ideally the basically deity of Jesus, right? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, the Godhood of Jesus Christ, right? The God man. And um, let's be honest, his knowledge on the Bible, it's not very strong. He gets all of his knowledge on the Bible based on people who also don't believe the Bible, right? He gets his knowledge on the Bible based on Jewish scholars, right? Who don't believe the Gospels anyways, or secular scholars who don't believe any of the Bible, or atheists, right? Or Gnostics, right? That's what he does, but he doesn't actually go to anybody that actually believes the Bible, right, and preaches the Bible. He won't. He won't get into that because he can't actually. He can't actually hold his own in that realm. So he gets all these people that don't really know the Bible that well, anyways. They just use the Bible for their own purposes, right? They use the Bible when they want to use it, but then they discard it for everything else, right? And that's that's the worst. That's the absolute worst. Right, piggybacking off of God's word, and then, and then snickering and ixnaying it over there. Like, how sneaky and pathetic is that? It's pretty pathetic. Pretty real pathetic. So, Adam's been going hard on Christ, right? And you know what, <laughs> Adam, that's your thing, right? See, Adam does tell a lot of truth, and. He mixes it with a lot of lies, too, a lot of untruths, because he's trying to muddy the water, right? And he's trying to turn people away, young people especially, away from their first love, which is Christ, and into this new age Gnosticism. That's what he's doing, right? Because that's what... He truly is. He's a new age Gnostic. Because he only came out as, you know, well, I went to church and I I know the gospel and the, I, you know, the basics behind the Bible and stuff like that. But he would never really commit to what he believed in and stuff. Right? And he still, I don't know if he does now. I don't really watch any of the stuff. But I've just seen the last few things and I've seen some of the other things in the past and whatnot. And I, I could see that he was heading down this road. And sure enough, look where he's at. <clears throat> and he's got Chris Perkins and Albert Bashai, right? And the three of them, they make this trinity, right? This trinity of fools because they all play on each other. They all support everything that each other says, right? And they're just right. Like a lot of their audience, like they're willing, they were willing, I will say, they were willing to basically cut half their audience, right? Because they'd have a lot of Christians that follow their stuff because it was about Zionism and whatnot. And then all of a sudden they just like flipped. But I knew it was coming. And now they just go hog wild in Christianity, right? And try to make Christians look stupid, right? But <clears throat> there's so many ways that the devil has tried to infiltrate the church and infiltrate Christianity that you can point to a lot of different areas where Christianity has failed or where Christianity is doing the exact opposite of what its commission is, right? You can see Jewish infiltration. You can see satanic infiltration, right? You can see other denominations and their infiltration and the occult infiltration. You can see all these infiltrations. Why? Because it's a institution, okay, that is on this earth, that is made up of men, okay? It's been commissioned by Christ, right? Christ is the head, but the churches 
are made up of autonomous churches in all the towns and all the cities and all the, the places, right? The shires and so on and so forth, all the townships. So every church is autonomous, right? But they all act in accordance to what the head says, which is Christ. Now, are you going to have over the years variations? Are you going to have splits, right? As places grow, you're going to have denominational splits. You're going to have places going here. You're going to have different kind of ideas and the way people want to go about things happen over here. And you're going to have these splits. You're going to have these theological splits. People are going to think differently on things, right? In Revelation, it talks about the seven, the seven churches. All those churches, well, they did things right and they did things wrong. Some of them did the same things as other churches did. Some of them did the same wrong things that other churches did. But all those churches were different churches that had different qualities about them and different shortcomings. Some of them were really good churches and some of them were really bad, right? Laodicea, especially. Right? Lukewarm vomit out of God's mouth, right? But all of them also had infiltrators. Who? Well, it says the Nicolaitans. Who the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans were those that uh, went to church, but they, you know, partied, they got drunk, they fornicated, they, you know, slept around. They they lived like the world, right? They did everything that the world would do, right? But also pretended to be Christian, right? So they lived in in extravagance, right? They lived worldly, so to speak. Well, that's what they did. They lived worldly. What else was there? There was the there was a prophetess, right? That had the men commit fornication, right? And to eat meat sacrificed on the idols. So you have different things infiltrating. You have women infiltrating churches, right? Taking over roles in leadership and bringing in all these different kind of doctrines. You see that today. You have the synagogue of Satan that is tempting the church, right? Those who say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Adam always basically talks about the Jews and everything's about, you know, how bad the Jews are and that the Jews are, you know, absolutely wicked and that they're leading the new world order. But the thing is, is there Jews that are part of it? Yes. Is there Gentiles that are part of it? Yes. <laughs> right? Are they trying to kill Jews? Yes. Are they trying to kill Gentiles? Yes. We're all a target by them. We're all a target. You understand that? And who's a target? Those who would believe on the Lord, right? Those who will not go along with the beast system, which we are in the, you know, basically the uh, preamble of, right? We are in the birth pains of. We're in the beginning of sorrows. But <clears throat> you get to understand that it says in Revelation that there's going to be Jews, a remnant of them, that are going to turn to Christ and they are going to repent and they're going to turn back to the Lord. So can we hate the Jews? No, can't hate the Jews because are all Jews communists? No. Are all those that are, you know, we know that in the cemetery in Israel, there is a section for Moses Hess who push labor socialism, right? So there is this whole thing that is taking place, right? Where Israel is going to be at the center of all things. But that's going to come after what we're seeing today, right? This here is all kind of a buildup where a lot of people have to die. A lot of the old world has to be destroyed in order to make way for this new world order, right? And then when the new world order is in place, well, then that is when the Antichrist will emerge because the 
Antichrist is first going to come with technology, with many signs and wonders, things that are going to be making the people want to worship him, right? And he's going to have a false prophet that's going to say, you know, this is the guy, right? And it even says that the Antichrist, the beast, he's going to get a wound to the head and he's going to be resurrected, <laughs> okay? So he is the story of the dying God, right? Audio cut. Ain't done. Is it? <laughs> so that is the example of the dying God. Okay. The Antichrist is the dying God. The dying and rising. Okay. The sun is a picture of that. Sun goes down. Sun comes up. Well, who is the true representation of death and resurrection? Jesus Christ, right? Died, power of the earth, three days, resurrected under the Father. Seen by many. All good revelation. No worries, bud. No worries. So, <clears throat> the Antichrist, if he dies and is resurrected, is he not going to be seen as God? Right? <laughs> right? That's what Revelation says. See, Adam Green pushes this theory that Jesus Christ is the story of the dying God. He's just an adaptation of that. And where did he get that from? He got that from, what was it called? Someone in the chat say it. What was that movie? The... Where at first they did all like the gods and who Jesus was and oh this is Osiris and this is Horus and and they were this and and this culture had had the story of Jesus and this story what was that? Not the Matrix. Uh, mm, you know what I'm saying. You guys know what I mean. And they did a redux to it. Da Vinci Code? No. <laughs> I think there might have been, there was a lot of basically the information they got for this came from the Da Vinci Code. Because why? Because Dan Brown was an occultist. He knew all about the occult thing. So he tried to basically say that the church was behind it, but it was occult stuff. No, uh, I can't remember. Anyways, that's where he gets it from. It was from a whole documentary where a lot of people seen it and people still reference to it. And usually most people that rep that talk about Christ as being just a representation of the dying God from all the from all the other mythologies, from all they all get it from this same video that's about basically the you know, the great reset. And at the very beginning it has this 10 minute thing about how the bible is false and christ is it's basically the end of pisces and we're going into the age of aquarius kind of idea right and he was the idea of the day but uh adam green he'll take all these things like that and he'll try to say that that's where the bible gets its idea from but the whole idea is that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It says that inspired means breathe. God breathed, right? Because he spoke the world into existence. He spoke creation into existence, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and without, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke it. He said, let there be light. <clears throat> Big bang, if you want to call it that, right? But God initiated it by saying, let there be light. 
So the Bible takes all the mythologies, okay? The Bible takes all of the ideas and concepts that man has made, and it actually condenses them, condenses them down in a truthful book, okay? And it is basically the testimony, complete testimony, the Genesis and Revelation of Jesus Christ. Because it says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was a form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So it says... And God said, let us make man in our image. Verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. Make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him male and female created he them and god blessed them and said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth and god said behold i have given me anyways so it says let us create man in our image well who's our image well he's talking about the angels no He's not talking about the angels, okay? Because the angels are not created in God's image, right? And whenever you see an angel in the Bible, they're always absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and they're never in the image of man, right? Sometimes they might come in a different form, right? They might come in the form of a man. But when they are of their heavenly form as an angel, they are not looking like a man. Because their descriptions are completely different than what a man's description is. Okay? And I don't got a description here right in front of me. If I get there at some point in time, we'll talk about some of these. I'll Someday I'll do a video or a stream talking about different angels and how they actually appear. Right? And again, they're not usually, you know, they don't look like, you know, a white guy with blonde hair. Right? That's kind of like the image of... Lucifer, right? When people think of Lucifer. Or He-Man. <laughs> right? So, God created them in His image. Right? Well, who's in the image of God? Well, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus Christ came and lived as a man. He was the word who became flesh. Okay? So we are created after God's own image, just as God's son, Jesus Christ, was created after God's image. And he was with God from the very beginning. Because it says in Revelation, because this is Genesis, like I said, in Revelation, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Right? I am the first and the last. So... He's the land that was slain from the foundations of this world, right? So you got to understand that Jesus Christ has always been there. But Adam Green, they'll say that Jesus Christ was a concept that came later, right? As this, you know, fake fulfillment. Well, I'm telling you, if someone can implant all that in this and be as consistent as they are in this over a period of, that's the thing, these this was put together 1611, right? But they weren't written in 1611, right? This book contains the history of known civilization, right? There's places that were just discovered in the last hundred years that they didn't know actually existed except it being in the Bible. Right. Um, an example is the uh, Hittite Empire. Right. 
They didn't believe that the Hittites were actually a powerhouse at one point in time. And then they actually found the Hittite kingdom, which was uh, Hattusha. Hattusha. And uh, anyways, like Jericho, they found Jericho, Sodom and Gomorrah. They found Sodom and Gomorrah, right? They found all these places. They're all real places, right? Egypt is a real place, right? All the empires of the world, world history are in this. The only places that aren't in here, and it even does mention them, because it mentions the, uh, the isles from afar off, right? And the peoples of the sea, right? So it does mention people from other places, right? But it mainly has to do with, obviously, Middle East, right? Because that was the area that it was written. But it records all that history. And it records pre-flood history, right? And it records the post-flood. And it records basically the dawn, the cradle of civilization in Babylon, right? The cradle of civilization, that's what we're always taught in school. And lo and behold, the first city built after the flood where they all gathered together was Babylon, right? So that's where Abraham came out of, the Ur, Ur of Chaldees. He came out of the Ur of Chaldees and then went down into Canaan, seen the promised land, had a dream, was told that he was going to go in Egypt and he was going to stay there and basically they would remain in Egypt for 400 years, 400 plus years or whatever, until the iniquity of the Amorites, the people who were in the land of Canaan, was fulfilled. And then at that point in time, the Hebrews would be, have been made a powerhouse, right? Because this is the crazy part, right? Abraham was told, you're not going to go, you've seen it, you're not going to go there yet. You know, you're going to end up in Egypt, right? You're going to end up in Egypt before you ever get back here, right? And what happened? Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael created the Arab nations. Isaac had Jacob and Esau, right? Esau, Edom, Jacob had 12 sons, right? One of them was Joseph. What happened to Joseph? Threw him down, threw him down the well, and then uh, he got sold to slavers, taken to Egypt. Became a worker for the Pharaoh, right? And eventually became a seer for the Pharaoh, and ended up be, be being named basically right hand Pharaoh's right hand man, a prince of the province. Okay. Time of famine came. They had the seven years of plenty where they gathered, and then they had the seven years of famine. Right? Then after that, is everything still going? Then after that, seven years of famine. During the seven years of famine, that's when his brothers came to Egypt. Because everybody was coming to Egypt because Egypt had all the food. Everywhere else had no food. They're coming to Egypt. Right? There's Joseph. They don't know it's Joseph. They haven't seen him in years since they <laughs> threw him down the well, right? So when they go, he reveals to them, you know, after a couple things take place, right? And uh, they end up staying in Egypt, right? And then the house of Joseph, right? The children of Israel end up populating and the Hebrews become a very large group of people inside of Egypt and at one point in time while Joseph was alive right you know they lived well in Egypt but after Joseph died the, they ended up forgetting about Joseph and all he'd done and then the next thing you see is a bunch of people coming up and saying there's way too many Hebrews here they're gonna <laughs> take over right so then Pharaoh said well we got to kill them we got to kill the firstborn we got to start calling them Right? That's what Pharaoh did. He started calling the population. And what happened? Moses got sent away. Right? And he was 
taken in by one of the Pharaoh's daughters, right? And he ended up being raised in the house of Pharaoh, right? And he was a goodly child. So they didn't, they, it specifically, it specifically mentions that he was, that he was good looking from the time he was a baby, right? I'm not saying anything, <laughs> right? But there's a general stereotype that certain people are not the most attractive at times. And so they specifically mentioned how good looking Moses was, right? As to, I assume, to blend in, right? To blend in with the Egyptians. So he's with the Egyptians. You know, everything happens there. He grows up, finds out what's going on, ends up killing an Egyptian, ends up going, living in the tents of Midian, you know, for years. And then, uh, you know, he's called to the mountain of God. Burning bush goes back to Egypt, confronts Pharaoh, right? He's timid at first. God says, do what I ask you to do. And it's all going to be good. <laughs> Just he gives them exact directions, like go into Pharaoh, take your staff, hit it on the ground, and say this, right? I'll take care of it. So, does the does the uh, judgments on Egypt, final judgment, creeping death, right? The angel of the Lord comes, blood on the posts, right? And I see again, I'm getting into too much detail, and I'm dragging this out. This is all talking about Abraham. Okay, Abram had a dream about all this. This is the iniquity of the Amorites being fulfilled. Okay, all this time has to take place, right? They had to go into Egypt. All this stuff had to happen. The generations of people that came up, all this to come to this point for something that was told to Abraham <laughs> like hundreds of years before, right? So, creeping death comes. Every house in Egypt's is hit by this and any Israelites that didn't uh, put the blood on their doorposts and lentils. So basically Pharaoh says, okay, get out, right? And they basically loot Egypt, right? And they throw all the gold and get out of here, right? And so they leave with treasure and tons of stuff. They leave Egypt. And uh, then, you know, Pharaoh ends up having, you know, second guessing himself and getting quite upset now that he doesn't have anything and he let them go. And, you know, he's not really feeling like God anymore, right? Because God hit Pharaoh in all the manners in which Pharaoh believes he is God, right? He hit the water. He hit the food supply. He hit the grain, the animals. He hit the people, Right, he put boils on them. Right, he caused darkness. Right, and the Pharaoh, he's supposed to be the light. Right, he's supposed to be the son of Ra. Right, the sun shines upon him. Right, he's an example of the dying God legend. Right, and God dismantled him, and he used Moses to carry it out. Right, and God did great things through Moses. Right. Moses did great things in the Lord. So they leave Egypt. Pharaoh chases after them. When they're leaving, they're following cloud of smoke by day. They don't know where they're going, right? Following the cloud of smoke by day, pillar of fire by night. Get to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's pressing on them. Moses separates the sea, right? They travel through, crush. Pharaoh chases them. He crushes the armies of Pharaoh in the sea, right? There's geological maps, imagery. It shows that there's a section in that sea that's basically a land, like a sand sandbar. It's, it's way more shallow than the rest of it. Still deep. Don't get me wrong. Still deep. But in that section, that's they find chariot wheels, different things like that, bracelets and so on and so forth. There is stuff that's been found there, right? Used to be all over YouTube. Used to be able to find all kinds of videos on that. And there's a couple longer, boring videos of like one guy, he's like a 
guy from Holland and he's with a, this businessman from Vietnam and this guy from Vietnam, he funded this whole expedition down there and got all like the mapping and like the geographical mapping where it like shows like layers and stuff, like some pretty expensive stuff. Anyways, so they get over there. Well, they spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness because they send spies into the land of Canaan. And when they come back, Joshua and Caleb are two of the spies. When they come back, they report to them that there's giants in the land, right? There's giants in these huge cities and they got these massive walls, like and the, you know, like the, the vegetation and everything like that. It's just crazy there. And it just, it swallows up the inhabitants and the men are huge. Like, and basically the 10 guys are like, there ain't no way we're going in there and fighting these guys. <laughs> they, they, they say like, we're like grasshoppers to them. Right. And we felt like grasshoppers to them. They, they specifically say that we look like grasshoppers to them and we felt like grasshoppers to them. Right. So, you know what I mean? If they're, whatever, however tall they are, say, say they are five, six, right? Well, if a guy's six foot five, he's pretty big, right? But you don't necessarily feel like a grasshopper, right? But if a guy's, you know, seven foot, <laughs> right? You're going to feel like a grasshopper. Seven foot and, and big, right? You're going to feel like a grasshopper. So, they were scared of these giants that inhabited the land, right? And in Genesis, it says, Genesis 6, there were giants in the land then and after that, right? There were giants in the land in those days and after. And as it shows, there were giants before the flood. There were giants after the flood, okay? And how does that happen? Is it of angels? Is it of angels that came down and mated with women? That's an idea that's out there. But that idea, I think uh, there's a psyop in that because it wants you to believe something basically off-worldly, off right? And people will believe that but they won't believe that god right could make mary pregnant <laughs> right they'll believe that angels came down and and mated with women right and made these giants right made cyclops but they won't believe that god was able to make mary pregnant with christ right so I'll explain more about the Giants thing because I've looked at it all, right? And I'm not saying I've looked at it all and I know it all. I'm just my conclusion because for a while I was definitely down the angels came to earth and the book of Enoch and all this stuff, right? Because pretty much, listen, pretty much everything that I talk about, most of this stuff at one point in time, I was like, what is this? I think this is the, I think this is it, <laughs> right? Maybe not everything, but like, there's a lot of these different ideas that I've taken the time to look into to find out if they were true. Just like the Bible, you're supposed to look at these things to find out they're true. Be a Berean who searches the scriptures daily to find out to see if these things are true. So, Robert Seffer, anthropologist, touches on many biblical subjects from a scientific perspective scientific perspective now i don't know what the quotation marks are for but i find sometimes when they say a scientific perspective they'll they'll try to find these really worldly ways to describe what the bible is trying to say when if you're somebody who believes the bible you don't you're not looking for an actual description on how this thing can happen because 
Again, if you believe in God, if you believe that God created, spoke the world out of existence, just like you believe it, uh, the Big Bang happened, right? Then you never seen it, but you believe it, right? There's things that I see every day. Like we see what's going on around us every day, but I believe it a lot less, right? None of us believe what's going on, right? We understand that it's a huge deception and we can see it all, right? Well, God and Christ and the future can't really necessarily see it all, right? We see it coming together, but we have faith and hope in something that's far off that we can't understand. So if anything, I'm very much a long-term thinker, and I'm not thinking in the present in the sense that, you know, Oh, I could die. I could if I do this, I could die. If I do that, I could die. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's not a you know fun thing to think about because it's like, oh, if I die, then I'm gonna be gone and my kids and my wife is I am not gonna I'm not gonna be around for them, right? But at the same time, my wife also knows where I'm headed, right? Just like if I lost my wife, I know where she's headed. Right? Same with my children. I'm not worried about that stuff, but it's still going to be very, very painful if anything will, would ever happen to them or if anything would happen to me, right? So I'm not void of feeling or anything like that. You got to go through all this stuff, right? And that's the thing. People get confused because they'll hear people say, well, God's in control of all this, right? 100%. God is in 100% control, but things happen. And bad things have happened to good people throughout history, all throughout history. Terrible, absolutely terrible things. People starving, people murdering each other, people raping each other, right? Mass genocide, right? Mass extermination campaigns. So, yes, God is in control, but crazy stuff happens. And if you are a believer in the Bible, you know what man is capable of because it's recorded throughout history. And one thing that I can see about today with the Bible is that nothing has changed. There's nothing new under the sun and how man acts and how man treats one another and how man thinks of himself, right? Man still thinks the same today as he did back then, right? And that's why unless... Christ returns and cuts this thing short, there'd be no flesh saved alive. Just like it says, if it were possible, the Antichrist would deceive the very elect. But that's not possible. And the Antichrist is looking to kill the elect, right? And if Christ doesn't return in time, then there'll be no elect saved alive. And if there's no elect saved alive, well, then there's no flesh saved alive. Okay, because once he takes out his people, well, then the world's going to be getting judged. But he's not going to destroy the world because he's going to have 144,000 chosen of Israel of all the 12 tribes on the earth as he's pouring out his judgment. Right. And they're going to be like Moses and Elijah on this earth. Right. Because they're going to be causing all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. They're going to be preaching the gospel when they have most of us killed, right? So they didn't, <laughs> going to get back around here. So they didn't go into the promised land, right? They had the bad report. I got off talking with the giants and then on to the Antichrist. See, that's, that's the thing. You can jump anywhere in the Bible and you'll lead back to Christ. You'll lead back to where you want to be. It, it's circular logic, man. No, it's just, it's God's word, right? And it's so consistent that you can literally go from one page to another page to another and you're just going to be consistent the whole way through, right? The problem is that people don't take enough time to actually go through God's word and understand it. And they don't ask God to help them. Right? You can't read it 
and not ask God to help you understand it. There's lots of stuff that I've read in this that I never understood. Lots of stuff that I've read, and I'm like, I don't know if I like this. Because there's lots of stuff in the Bible that people read. Now, for me, it turns me off, right? I'm fine with it, but lots of other people, right? Like, <laughs> you go through the Old Testament. Just go through the Old Testament, and that will turn a lot of people off, right? But when you understand God, when you understand evil, when you understand why he sent his son, when you understand why his son's going to return one day, then you understand why God, and you understand history and whatnot, you understand why God is the way he is and why he does the things that he does. Because you can see history in the Bible because it is cataloged through the children of Israel. Okay? Okay. And the funny thing is, there's a lot of cross crossing over with other people groups. There's lots of other people from different people groups in the Bible. That's why at the end, okay, at the end of all this, when Christ returns, there's still going to be nations. It's not every not everybody is going to be completely wiped out, right? Because there's going to be many people that don't take the mark of the beast but maybe they don't uh, maybe they don't uh, get saved either right but they are able to survive it right as possible because it says that those that are with Christ when he returns are going to be priests and kings and what does that mean it means that they're going to be given places of authority in ruling over the nations. Well, who's the nations? Well, the nations are the people that are still alive, that are still living. So you got to understand that there's actually going to come a time when there's people that are living and dying for a thousand years during the thousand year reign of Christ, right? The real thousand year Reich, not associated with that Reich, <laughs> okay? So when he's reigning for a thousand years, there's going to be nations and they're going to be living and dying, but they're going to be learning the ways of the Lord. And at the end of that thousand years, Satan, who is bound in a prison, will be released and he will go out through the nations, deceive them one more time, and they will all gather themselves again against Christ, against Israel. Okay? But that's not the Israel that people think of today. Okay? That's a totally different Israel that's way off into the future. So I'm not going to spend much time there. The thing is, if, so, if someone tries to understand the book of Revelation, and they hear me talk about these things, and they, they haven't read it, they're not familiar with the Bible, they're going to be like, what is he talking about? What is the point of it? Right. And that's some that's a part where I get kind of lost that I take for granted that people don't know that much about the Bible. Because yeah, just I think I think there's a lot of people that are just unfamiliar with, with the Bible in general. They know parts of the Bible, they know pieces of scripture, but they in general don't understand the Bible. I think they're trying to. I do believe they're trying to. But I don't think they fully understand. I don't. I don't think they know even to ask God to ask, help them understand the Bible, understand the, God's word, right? Help me believe it. Help me understand it. <laughs> help me learn it so I can, so I can determine whether or not I, I truly believe it or not. Because there's no point. <laughs> there's no point in in playing along with this, right? There's no point in playing church. There's no point in playing religious right that doesn't get you anywhere that is usually the problem most people that's usually how they become lukewarm right that's how they become ineffective and that's how it come i think a lot of people get turned away from the church too because they see the church and they think oh those people are hypocrites because they're supposed to be so good well maybe you shouldn't also think that everybody that 
you should understand that everybody falls short, right? But people that are supposed to be religious, that's what that's the thing. They are being Nicolaitans, right? People that go to church, but they don't seem any different from the world. Where when you got people in the world who seem way more separated from the world, and they look at the church and they say, Jumpins, you guys are a lot like the world. What's going on here? Right? So that's where, you know, I like to come in because I grew up really, you know, blue collar, grew up from the woods, you know, country boy. And I never seen myself as a super religious person. I always found myself on the wrong side of things uh, with people at church and stuff. I was just always, you know, maybe a little too, asked a little too many questions. and was a little bit too aggressive, always, you know, quick to, you know, run and jump feet first into something. And uh, so I spent a lot of my time in and out of, in and out of church because I just never felt like I belonged, right? And uh, couldn't help it. But I always, I always felt like I belonged, you know, with God. But I had a hard time in church. And I think a lot of people, a lot of dudes, can relate to that. You have a hard time going to church and sitting there and thinking, "What's the point of all this?" Right? And a lot of churches. They've lost their fire. They've gone not even cold. They've just gone lukewarm. They've just gone the way of the world. And again, if you're outside and looking for something and then you open a church door and you're like, you know, this just seems like a, you know, self-help sermon or this just seems like something that I could, I could find something better on YouTube from a secular scholar or an atheist scholar or something like that, right? It's like... You've got this whole book here, and some of these guys barely even preach from it. But you know what? A lot of those guys were also put in place. They crept in unawares. They went off to Bible school, and they were taught these things. And they were taught not to use the Bible. They were taught not to know the scriptures. They were taught that, oh, you know, people just can't understand the scriptures, so don't bother preaching to them. Don't bother teaching them. They just won't get it. And it's like, that's the worst thing you can do. What stupid logic is that? You imagine it's like, well, we'll just never get it. So don't teach them right from wrong. Really? And that's what the church has become in a lot of ways. And that's why the church is dropping the ball. And when I say the church, I mean the what's seen as the institution. Because the church is the body of Christ, which is made up of people. Okay. The church as the institution is what everybody sees as basically the, the logos for Christianity, right? All the different logos. The I, When somebody first thinks Christianity, the first thing that comes to their minds, right? Those initial images, like Adam Green trying to be look like Christ, right? So... <clears throat> They talk about Adam Cadmon, okay? And just to finish that other thing up first. So when they wander in the wilderness, <laughs> I go way off again, guys. So they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because 10 of them said, we can't go in that land. Caleb and Joshua said, with God, we can go in there. And God said, nope, because you guys are doubting me after I did everything that I did for you in Egypt well, after I crushed Pharaoh in the sea and you're worried about these guys over here? You don't think that I can move them? You don't think I can bring those walls down? Right? So God's mad. Wouldn't you be like, think about it. It's like, it's like when you explain something to your kids and you, you explain it and you show them you know, step one, step two, step three, and you and you show them all the ways, and they're like, "Wow, Dad, you, like you do that really well," and and so on, and so forth, and they're amazed at you know, and you're showing them, and they're like, "Wow, well, this is cool! I can't wait to do this," right? And then you're like, "Okay, well, I'm gonna go inside now. You, I'll leave you to it, kid." And you go in, and then you peek out the window, and it's just like 
chaos. Right? The kids already, you know, got the bike upside down and they got their leg twisted around. <laughs> and it's not a good scene. Well, that's basically what the children of Israel were like. It's like, God showed them all the miracles in Egypt, led them out with a high, hard hand, right? And then they're like, oh, no, no, we're not going in there. Mm. Right? So God said, you're going to wander for 40 years until that doubting generation, basically anybody above Caleb and Joshua's age, until that generation dies. Until every one of them is dead, you're not going in there. Right? And so they wandered in the wilderness, and God fed them in the wilderness, and they griped and complained in the wilderness for those 40 years. But if they wouldn't have griped and complained in the first place, and they wouldn't have wandered those 40 years, and they wouldn't have had to gripe for 40 years. Right? And God stuck with them. God stayed with them the whole time. He's like, my goodness, I just, I, I gotta, I'm gonna literally have to drag you guys across this desert. Right? He, well, he did too, right? He literally, he led them, right? When they had, when Moses brought them the Ten Commandments, when they built the Ark of the Covenant, right? What went before them? The Ark of the Covenant. It went ahead of them, right? Cloud of smoke, pillar of fire went before them. God always went before them, showed them the way, right? Because he was showing them something. And through them, eventually, it would show the world the light of the, onto the nations. And then eventually, from them, one would come who would be the light onto the nations, right? But the world didn't recognize him when they came, and they still don't recognize him. But one is going to come in his name that everybody's going to recognize. And then when that happens, then he will come. Right? So all that, they wandered for 40, 40 years. And then finally, they said, okay, guys, it's time to go in. And when you go in, you got to kill everybody. Because... 400 years, the iniquity of the Amorites, don't quote me on, the, on that year number, the iniquity of the Amorites was fulfilled. And what was that iniquity? Well, they reached the tipping point of their civilization, right? They had giant cities, great walls. They were great warriors. They were decadent, right? They had all kinds of nice things. And what were they starting to do? They were sacrificing children, right? They were sacrificing people to their gods because that's what all civilizations end up doing. They end up worshiping gods that are all about degeneracy and all about just the worst things, abominations that man could think of. And when a nation gets to that point, God sends another nation that's unknown to them in the cleanup house. And he's done it time and time and again throughout history. Time and time again. And he's doing it right now. He's going to do it again after. So, Abraham had that dream. All that time ago. All of, like, Genesis and the whole story of the Israelites, it's all based on, like, Abraham was given a dream, was told to come out of the Ur of Chaldees, went to Canaan, went to Egypt, dwelt there. All this stuff happened, right? And then finally they went in the land, and then they had to conquer the land. They got into many battles, slayed many peoples, but they didn't slay everybody. They had, who was it? The Canaanite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, the Parasite, Parasite, um, Amalekite, the Amorite. Seven nations. Anyways, and among them were the Rephaim. Who were the Rephaim? The giants. There's literally a place called the Valley of the Giants, right? Agabashan, Agabashan, he was a giant. Goliath, 
he had four brothers, right? David, five little stones he took, right? See, they were in Israel. They conquered these other nations that worshipped all these other gods, the gods of the mountains, the gods of the valleys, the gods below the earth, the gods above the earth, right? The gods of the sea, right? The gods of the air. They worshipped all the gods, right? They worshipped the phallus. They worshipped the vagina, right? Baal. Ashtoreth, right? They worshipped all these things. So all of these idols and these pagan deities were all ready in the land. And they would have come and they would have slain these things. And they would have burnt them, right? And destroyed them utterly, completely. Everything about them destroyed them. But then there was nations that they left and they didn't quite root them all out. So those nations then dwelt with them. And because they left that remnant, right? Then what eventually happened? Those pagan cultures eventually contaminated their culture. And then they started worshiping Baal, Ashtoreth, Shemosh, the abomination of... Uh, um, Moab they did all these things and then history will say well the Israelite the Hebrews were actually worshipping multiple gods when they were in the land of Canaan and there's uh, you know um, evidence of this based on these different artifacts so on and so forth and it's like yeah no they did they totally did because the people of the land were pagan. And when Israel was following God, they destroyed the idols. They didn't have anything to do with them. But then when they started being oppressed by these different groups, it sort of started mixing in with these groups where they started leaving off the laws of the Lord. Well, they started bringing in the gods. They started worshiping other gods. They started doing the things that the other nations did because why? They liked what they saw from the other nations. Why? Because Israel, they when they went in and they had the land, they separated the 12 tribes and all the families in those tribes. And everybody had their own parcel of land. Everybody had their own little parcel of land. And then the Levites, they had their parcels of land throughout the kingdom because they were they traveled around, they were the priests. Okay. So it was made up of autonomous places. <laughs> right autonomous zones owned by families that all had their part all had their own inheritance okay they all had their own inheritance and they had laws based on basically if you know different things happen in time hardships happen some 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 people benefit some people have a hard time some people really benefit some people go really downhill right so some people get indebted to other people some things don't work out for some people some people have more children than others some people only have girls some people have a lot of boys like different things happen and then after every like 50 years they'd have a jubilee year where they basically reset all their debt and so on and so forth and how they live what kind of system they didn't have any kings but they had judges that would rise up when when man would begin to do what was right in their own eyes and they began leaving off the law of the lord when they began seeking after other gods when they began seeking after the other nations right and they would start getting corrupt and bringing in the things of the world. Well, then they would start being oppressed. Then they would start noticing their country turning upside down and calamity started happening, right? Their country being overwhelmed with, you know, um, people that are not local, people that don't have the same ideals as you, people that don't have the same values as you, people that don't uh, worship the same God as you, um, people that, uh, you know, like stuff like killing babies, you know, people that, you know, like um, drag time story hour, right? People that want uh, lenient senses for pedophiles and, you know, want uh, harsh senses for anybody that questions the government, right? When wicked men uh, leave, then good men hide themselves. But it's, uh, it's kind of getting time where we don't hide ourselves anymore. Getting off topic with saying that, but um, that's what happened in Israel because it's all a shadow of what's happening today. So when I talk about the Bible too, guys, 
I hope you understand the nuances in a lot of my statements too, and how the Bible is reflecting things that are happening in the world today and how society is, how the culture is, what happens in the culture and what happened with Israel every time they degenerated away from God, right? Well, they worship, they got into Baal worship. What did they do in Baal worship? They had temples of Baal and they had priests and priestess, pre, priestesses of Baal, right? And what did they, what did they do in the temple of Baal? Porn. Pornia. That's what they did. You would go, you'd have sex with the priestess, right? You'd have, they, they had orgies, they'd do all this stuff. They worshiped in the groves. They worship, they literally worship phalluses. Okay. They literally worship giant vaginas and things that look like vaginas. Like they did all kinds of crazy degenerate stuff, like what we're seeing today, right? Followers, the worshipers of Baal and Ashtoreth, right? We, are we there already? One hour and 11 minutes, PC, battery running low. How much time do we got? 10 minutes, 10%, nine minutes remaining. So I'd give that really about five minutes it gives me the warning so they worshiped other gods and then historians will say well they weren't always a monotheistic people they worshiped other gods as evidenced by here yeah of, of course they did some some fell away right like today you know people that say they're christians but they're living like the world or they don't even believe the bible right are they actually christian it's like not all not all those who say they are of Israel are of Israel. Okay. Not all those who say they are Jews are of the synagogue of Satan. Okay. You know one thing about Jews? The only person who knows who, who the Jews are in the world, like truly, is God, right? The 12 tribes. Who who you can't pin down, pin down the 12 tribes. Why? Because when the northern kingdom was destroyed, when the Assyrians came in, what they do? Because the Assyrians had the thing that they did to everybody was they came in, they take you, take you out of your home, take you out of your country, go and mingle you with other people, force you to basically rape you and force you to uh, be with other groups, right? Basically breed out, breed out that group of people and mix them up with other people and then repopulate. They redistributed the Northern Kingdom. They literally plucked the people up, took it out and put different people in the land. But then when there was all these beasts and everything like that, that came and was like attacking everybody and killing everybody and causing a lot of problems, they ended up bringing some people back to, to teach them some of the ways, right? But they were never a full people again. But God knows who has connections to what, right? God knows. I, I, and that's that's another thing too. Is anybody anybody know why they're why all of the you know blood testing and the genetic testing and the you know where where are your roots? You understand what that's all for? They're trying to figure out who's who and who's from where, from what tribe, actually, 23 and me, that's one, Brandon, Glock, Glock, I always want to call you Glock, that's cool though, call you Glock, Brandon, Glock, Br Brandon, Brandon, Glock, You're like, <laughs> Fritz Bar, how's it going buddy, well guys, this is going to die here, I've been going on for a while, seven minutes, I've got a few minutes, Braden likes the Glock comment. I would too, right? It's like when I used to work uh, in corrections, I, they used to call me Pistol Pete. And that was a good, that was a good name to have, Pistol Pete. Pistol Pete. And everybody called me Pete. It was always Pete. Pete. <laughs> it was never Peter. Never Peter. Always Pete. <laughs> Let's go, Brandon. I see before we go, we'll end it on a good note. Um, I seen the uh, the Simpsons one where it's like, uh, are they saying Boo Earns? But they are they but they switch it and say, are they saying fuck Joe Biden? 
no, they're saying, let's go, Brandon. And then last moment, I was saying, let's go, Brandon. Uh oh, I'm dying. <laughs>